Uh, hello, welcome everyone to the webinar today. Uh, it is almost time and we could see that many people have joined. So we have today amongst us uh, CMA Ajit Sevadas, who is a pract practicing uh, cost accountant and chartered accountant as well. So he will just take you through the uh, insights of the ICDS and inventory valuation today. Uh, sir, over to you. You can just. Thank you. Thank you, Devapradada, sir. Hope I am audible. I am, I am visible. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. You are audible and visible as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. A very good afternoon. All esteemed professional colleagues. Today we are uh, having a webinar on quite an important topic, a very relevant topic as far as our profession is concerned. We know. Budget 2023 came up with a proposal. Section 142 got amended in such a way that uh, a section subsection 142 2A was inserted. Wherein assessing officer at the time of scrutiny. Can engage a cost accountant in order to value the inventory. So our scope as a practicing cost accountant after this insertion definitely have multifolded. So in order to grab that an opportunity. As a practicing professional, definitely yes. We should have that uh, professional responsibility. To undertake that. Uh, assignment and to do our best to. Make the. Assessment happen. So in order to get. Equipped for those. Newly enacted opportunities. It's a very welcome move by the tax research department to have the webinar series on this inventory valuation. Form 6C has been issued by. Or the draft form 6C has been issued by the income tax department in the mid of August. So with pertaining to that uh, form 6C. There are various columns assigned in form 6C in order to value. To be reported by a cost accountant after inventory valuation. If you go by that uh, form 6C, there are separate columns for those inventories which are covered under ICDS standards, not covered under ICDS 2, that is with regarding to agriculture sort of mineral oil sort of natural gas sort of shares and securities for sale sort of things separate ICDS standards are there. Apart from which. So many other columns for. Uh, basic details plus variations with the valued. ICDS standard valued stock with that of actual reported value by SSEs. So for this form 6C, it is quite sure that without having an elementary knowledge, fundamental knowledge as well as a practical knowledge in this ICDS 2 and the related ICDS standards, we would not be in a position to undertake that an assignment. So with the prelude. Let me on. Discussing the topic for the day today. We would be discussing. As I mentioned earlier, in order to fill that form 6C. We are required to have. Practical knowledge with regarding to that ICDS 2 standard valuation of inventories. Plus some other standards are also there, which would be also helpful in order to value. In case of construction contracts, share securities, etc. We are having two sessions. Today we would be covering up and uh, the points up to which we have from there we would be starting tomorrow also same time. What we have planned is we would be discussing the standard as such. We would be having various illustrations and examples in between. Definitely yes, we would be having some question and answer sessions also in order to clarify doubts if any arises. So let me on to the session. I 
open to trying to share the PPT. Hope the PPT is visible to you. Deva Brada, sir, is the PPT visible now? Uh, yes, sir, it is visible. OK, so today the webinar on inventory valuation draft form 6C read along with the section 1242 2A we are going to discuss. Background I was mentioning. Budget 2023 came up with this new section 142 2A. Mid of August we had that form, form 6C. Form 6C if you go by, definitely yes. ICDS2 related valuation we would be required to do by. Why? Because for income tax valuation purposes, it is not the normal accounting standards AS or in case of companies applicable in AS applicability. Rather, for the purpose of valuation of inventory, 145.2 related ICDA standard has to be followed. Section 145A also has been amended in such a way that the valuation of inventory should be accompanied as if mentioned under ICDS 2 standard. So we are going to discuss the intricacies of stock valuation with relation to ICDS 2. Then I was mentioning in ICDS 2 in scope itself, there are certain exclusions. How to value the inventory for construction contracts? How to value the inventories for shares, securities, debentures, financial instruments held for sale? How to value agricultural producers, livestock, mineral oil, oils, etc. Separate standards are there. So those standards also with regarding to the valuation of inventories, we would be covering up. So I was mentioning this to be two day seminar series. Today, so much as possible, we would be covering up. From today's session, we would be continuing tomorrow too. Section 145, the base. So as I mentioned earlier, the valuation of inventory is being assigned by income tax officer at the time of assignment to at the time of scrutiny assessment to the cost account and for valuing the stock. So here the valuation of stock should be as per the income tax related provisions. Section 145 of Income Tax Act talks about the method of accounting. So here the income chargeable under PGPP profits and gains from business or profession as well as income from other sources. The assessee do have got that privilege either to follow cash system of accounting or a mercantile system of accounting, but subject to subsection number two. So what does subsection number two prescribe? Subsection number two prescribe the central government may notify in official gazette from time to time. That is income computation and disclosure standards to be followed by any class of assessee or in respect of any class of income. So here it is sure those assessees who are having income under the head profits and gains from business and profession nor under from the head uh, income from other sources. They have to follow ICDS standards as issued by the department by the central government. And if they are not following that ICDS standards, then at the time of scrutiny, at the time of assessments, whatever it is, assessing officer would have that assessment to be done under best judgment assessment way that is under section 144 way. So this is the background for introduction and compliance of so called income computation and disclosure standards. From this section 145 to only the assessees who are having income under PGBP as well as income from other sources are required to comply with ICDS standards. Totally 10 standards are there. ICDS 1 to ICDS 10 for the time present. And as I rightly mentioned earlier, ICDS 2 with regarding to inventory in normal cases, there are separate cases wherein which are being covered under some other ICDS also. So this is the section wherein the inventory valuation should be as per ICDS. Then Act 2018 amended 145A in order to get it accommodated with ICDS standards. Before amendment, there was a peculiar way for valuing inventory which was not as per ICDS standards. Sooner ICDS standards got implemented. Finance Act 2018 amended this section 145A also in order to make it aligned along with 
valuing the stock as per inventory as per ICDS standards. So what does this speak 145A if you go by? For the purpose of determining the income chargeable under the head PGBP, first clause, the valuation of inventory shall be made at lower of actual cost of net realizable value computed in accordance with income computation and disclosure standards notified under subsection 2 of 145.2. I have 2 of 145. I was mentioning 145.2 speaking about uh, following complying with ICDS. So the valuation of inventory shall be made at lower of cost or net realizable value as per determined ICDS standards. Second one, the valuation of purchase of sale of goods and uh, services and inventory shall be adjusted in order to include tax, duties, etc. Third one, inventory being securities not listed on a recognized stock exchange has to be followed by ICDS. Inventory being security other than referred above shall be valued at cost or net realizable value. That also has to be as per ICDS standards. So in short, almost all the inventories which are being for that uh, business entity you are having income under PGBP, how to go by 145.2. In short, they have to follow what ICDS respective standards. So this is the statutory backing. This is the statutory backing section 145 and 145, 145A speaking about the values, the revenue recognition, the tangible assets, contingent liabilities, inventories, accounting policies, everything has to be under uh, ICDS compliances proceedings you have to follow by. So using this statutory provisions only, the stocks have to be valued as per uh, this uh, income tax purposes. And uh, again, do I repeat this valuation as per ICDS may it be from ICDS 1 up to ICDS 10. These standards prescribes the items to be revised, the items to be revalued, may it be revenue, may it be inventory, may it be construction contract, revenue value, whatever it is, may it be changes in foreign currency exchange rate, whatever it is. All these ICDS related provisions has to be implemented to those items only for computation income tax purposes. Again, do I repeat, these standards are prescribed in order to rearrange, revalue those items only for the purpose of income tax computation. In books, you have to follow the normal AS. In books, you have to follow the normal in AS wherever applicable. For the purpose of income tax computation alone, for the purpose of income tax computation alone, this ICDS standards has to be followed. So the valuation as per books, add or less the value difference if it comes on to ICDS, the differential income, even it is going up or it is getting down, that has to be valued for the purpose of income tax alone, income tax alone, income tax alone. So with this prelude, let us move on to discuss with ICDS 2 standard valuation of inventories. Preamble to the standard speaks that uh, this income computation and disclosure standard is applicable for the computation of income tax, income chargeable for the head PGBP and income from other sources and not for the purpose of maintenance of books of accounts, the point that I was mentioning just before. These standards ICDS are not meant to keep books of accounts. You are not supposed to follow ICDS 2 in order to value the stock and keep the same as, as if per your books in your tally, in your SAP software, whatever it is, or in your physical books. These ICDS standards, the stock value differences are only for the purpose of income tax computation, income tax computation, income tax computation, and not for the purpose of maintaining the books of accounts. So that thing definitely is we have to keep it in mind. So these ICDS standards are confined only for the purpose of making income tax computation. For that basis, income has to be recomputed and not for the purpose of maintaining books of accounts. Then if there are any conflict between any provisions in ICDS standards, then with that of Income Tax Act, then the Act would have to override ICDS standards. So earlier that was the situation at the time of implementation of ICDS, this section 145A was there. So that 145A is within Income Tax Act and any, any provision, any compliance procedure in 145A if it is different from that of ICDS standards, then definitely yes, section 145A would have to prevail over ICDS standards. So in order to confine only 2018 Finance Act made that 145A got amended. 
scope. So scope of the standards. So for what are all the inventories which would be valued under ICDS 2? If you ask, the standard itself prescribes that this ICDS shall be applied for valuation of inventory. The, ter the, the term inventory is being defined in the standard itself. We would be defining the term inventory separately. So for the purpose of valuing the inventories, the below mentioned the below mentioned items would not be counted. So which are all those items? First item work in progress under construction contracts. We know ICDS 3 deals with uh, construction contracts. So there are a peculiar method in order to value the revenue as well as the expenses, reserves, etc. under ICDS 3 construction contract standard. So that thing we would be discussing at the time of uh, discussing those valuation for construction contracts for the time being just uh, just to presume that for the purpose of valuing construction contract work in progress or finished goods or inventories at uh, their hand. This standard ICDS 2 would not be applicable. Then work in progress under other standards, say tangible fixer asset is there or any other uh, standards coming up within that work in progress, which is being covered under any other standards. Then this ICDS 2 would not be applicable. Then shares, debentures and any other uh, financial instruments I was mentioning. It speaks about the securities held for sale. Therein it would be mentioning how to value such inventories. Then the standard also keeps away livestock, animals, birds, etc. Agricultural and forest producers, mineral oil, ores and natural gases, etc. And how it would be done also we would be discussing later. Maybe today or maybe we, tomorrow we would be discussing how to value the inventories with regarding to livestock, agricultural, forest produce, mineral oil, etc. Then there are certain spares, machinery spares, which are being used in connection with tangible fixer assets. So in that standard ICDS for tangible fixer asset, it is being mentioned how to value such machinery space. So these five categories, work in progress for construction contracts, work in progress under any other standards, including PPE, then uh, shares, debentures, and any other uh, financial instruments held for sale, resale, not as an investment, livestock, agricultural produce, forest produce, minerals, etc., machinery, spare parts, uh, for a tangible fixer assets. This would be covered with some other standards and some other method. It would not come under the purview of this standard ICDS 2. If you compare close by close with uh, AS as well as Inde AS, you may see almost uh, the scope being same. Except for the reason that uh, spare parts, servicing equipment, standby equipment, etc are not under the purview of AS 10 there at as per AS 2. Here also there is no mention about machine space in Inde AS. Apart from which almost everything are in par with the scope as far as ICDS comparison with AS along with Inde AS. Then now if we move on to the definition part, you may see only the critical definitions I'm trying to define here. The first and foremost important definition with regarding to the term inventory. So what is an inventory? Inventories are assets held for sale in ordinary course of business. So it is not for the purpose of making it onto production part or not to intended to get used for the purpose of business, not for the purpose of resale or in process of the production for sale. Say, for example, may, may raw material, etc. are in production or in process for the production for such sale or in form of material or supplies to be consumed in the production consumables. So all these things would be comprising under the term inventory. So if you see that form number 6C I was mentioning, the cost accountant which is required to report to the department with regarding to stock valuation in form 6C, if you see, there are eight types of classifications which we are supposed to give as an inventory. It comprises of raw material, it comprises of work in progress, finished goods, consumables, space, jigs fixtures, etc. So all these things, are under this term inventory alone. So this is what being defined under ICDS 2 also inventories, which is being held for sale in ordinary course of business in process or in process of production for such sale in form of material or supplies to be consumed in the production process. First thing. The next thing we know almost all three standards may it be AS2, maybe ICDS standard or maybe in the AS concern standard. All three, if you see, the inventories has to be 
valued lesser value of cost or net relaceable value. NRV or cost, whichever is low, lower, shall be the value for the inventory to be assigned by. So the term net relaceable value definitely is quite an important definition. Net relaceable value is the estimated selling price in the ordinary course of business, less estimated cost of completion and estimated cost necessary to make the sale. So what is net relaceable value? Kindly don't uh, misconsider this term net relaceable value with that of fair market value, FMV. That concept FMV is somewhat different from that of this, uh, this term NRV. So definitely yes, fair market value NRV. Both has got different meaning. Here it should be constituted to be under this term NRV. How do NRV would differ from fair value and all we would be discussing later. So the second definition for the term being what? NRV, net realizable value. So what is net realizable value? The amount estimated to get sold less the expenses which is being incurred in order to make to that point of sale. That expenses has to be directed from that estimated selling price. Then that differential value would be termed to be NRV. So this NRV has to be given or this NRV has to be valued for finished goods as well as working progress and raw material as a replacement cost. So all these things how to value NRV and all we would be discussing later. So definition part over. Then quite an important one. The charging point of this ICDS2, even though everyone is aware with regarding to how to measure an inventory, again, for the sake of clarity, I'm mentioning measurement, how to measure, how to value the inventory if you go by paragraph number three to ICDS prescribe that inventory shall be valued at cost or net realizable value, whichever is lower. So this is the formula. This is the basic charging point under which the inventories has to be valued valued at cost or NRV, whichever is lower. Item by item, this inventories has to be valued. Suppose if we are having 1000 raw material, for every type of raw material, this cost or NRV we have to value. How to value, when to value, techniques for valuation, methods of valuation, everything we would be discussing as part of standards in the next paragraphs. So for the time being, charging point being what? How to measure the inventory? Inventory shall be valued at cost or NRV, whichever is lower. So measurement. So how to measure? First thing, cost you have to compute. NRV you would be discussing later. So first term, cost. So how to measure the cost? How to estimate the cost why because in uh, the techniques for valuing the inventory it was been mentioned even it can be an estimated value standard cost also can be the cost so how to estimate or how to compute the cost if you go by you may see the total cost comprises of four elements four elements four elements which are they? What are they? The cost of an inventory comprises of all cost of purchase. All cost of cost of purchase. All cost of purchase meaning the price at which you are purchasing it from your supplier. Price of that product. Price of that raw material. Price of that consumable. Price of that spares. So that price plus carriage inward unloading charges, freight inverts, all those related cost of purchase would be included under the term cost, first element, cost of purchase. And the distinctive feature of ICDS2, if you compare with any other accounting standards or normal accounting mechanism is that for computing that cost of purchase, in AS2, in AS, wherever it is, usually we would not include that portion of indirect taxes. May it be central excess, may it be GST. If we are getting the credit, if we are going to re-get, we are going to get the credit of such taxes paid as in normal cases, that value of GST or central excess would not be added, would not be grossed up while valuing 
such cost of purchase. But here, one among the distinctive feature, distinctive feature of this ICDS2 to be in such a way that or 145A in specific is in such a way that you have to include such taxes, duties, cesses, etc. Those points we would be again elaborating it later, but for the time being, for computing the cost of inventories, the first element being cost of purchase. Purchase value, freight inward, unloading charges, everything should be under that term cost of purchase. Then, in case of a manufacturer, in case of a manufacturer, such raw material has to be converted to work in progress, then on to what? Yes, finished goods. So, cost of conversion is also there. Electricity charges, labor charges, every other things are also there. So what are all those things would be covered and would be included under the term cost of conversion. But while computing such cost of conversion, there is no reference in such a way that in order to include what indirect taxes along with here. So there at the time of cost of purchase only you have to include what indirect taxes elements. So first one cost of purchase. Second element for the cost of inventories being cost of conversion raw material to finished good stage. What are all the conversion costs you have to gross up? Then the third element, another peculiarity, another distinctive feature of this ICDS2 being neither in AS2 nor in, uh, in the AS, you cannot trace this uh, point cost of service. So what is cost of service and all we would be discussing. So that cost of service is also included for that cost of inventories. Then any other cost, any other cost incurred in bringing the inventories to their present location and condition. So all the other sorts of costs other than mentioned above as in case of cost of purchase or conversion cost or cost of service any other cost would be comprised under the fourth residual element of cost of inventories being other cost so this many bifurcations this many elements are there for computing cost of inventories we would be separately discussing each and every element later so this cost inventory cost comprises of purchase cost conversion cost other cost I was mentioning. Now, special attention is required from my August audience with regarding to the next array of things that I am going to discuss. But practical implications are there. So do I invite everyone's keen attention towards the point that I am going to discuss right now? So three elements I was there or four elements was there. Service cost apart, three elements are there. So out of which purchase cost including import duties plus all other taxes, everything you have to include, I was mentioning. Then factory or house, direct labor, joint cost. Three types of conversion costs are there, plus what other cost is also there. Among those factory overheads, if you see, we can see two types of factory overheads, fixed, variable, definitely yes, semi-variable overheads are also there. That semi-variable overheads, fixed portion you have to gross up along with the fixed overheads, variable portion of semi or variable overheads towards variable overheads. So totally there are two types of overheads, fixed overheads as well as variable overheads. How to absorb, how to add, how to mix this factory overheads along with cost of conversion if you go by. Fixed overheads at normal capacity, quite important. Fixed overheads at normal capacity, if the total normal capacity or less than such a capacity has been utilized, then fixed cost at normal capacity has to be absorbed. But if it is more than that of that normal capacity, then the actual sort of a thing has to be absorbed as fixed overhead. That point we would be discussing again later. Illustrations are there in order to understand this concept better. But anyway, you have to see the capacity utilization, capacity utilization. On the basis of that capacity utilization only, the fixed costs are being absorbed to the cost of production while absorbing this conversion cost point. If it is at par with normal capacity or less than normal capacity, what is normal capacity and all, we would be defining it later. But normally, how much it is being utilized? If it is lesser than or actual the normal capacity, how it would be. If it is more than that of normal capacity, the production, how it would be, we would be discussing. Then variable overhead, always actuals we would be taking at normal capacity. Then in case of joint products, we know in practical, 
there cannot be a single industry having a single product definitely yes almost possible there will be either some joint products or some other byproducts so in such realistic situations how to compute the cost for joint products how to compute the cost for byproducts joint products we know in our academical days we had studied that it has to be splitted at a split off point the cost till separation plus cost after separation then when we sail at the point of separation less the margin what would be the cost everything we had estimated that way we would be required to apportion the cost of joint products as well as in case of less value products tend to be as what by products so this many things we would be discussing later part of the session so for the time being the only the point that i want to convey here is with regarding to absorption of fixed overheads at par or lesser than that of normal capacity more than that of normal capacity then purchase price first element if you go by in the total cost of inventory concept total four elements were there out of which first one purchase price so i was mentioning the first and foremost peculiarity regarding to this icds2 standard is the purchase price would be including the duties as well as the taxes may be those taxes which are going to get credited or that you are going to get uh, uh, back in form in form of input tax credit wherever it is but still all those taxes has to be included then freight inward has to be included all any other expenses all other expenditure directly in relation to purchase also has to be included now what are all the elements which has to be excluded the standard says trade discount has to be excluded we know the trade discount the discount at the time of purchase itself in the invoice itself that amount of discount would have been reduced so that trade discount can be deducted but not cash discount cash discount cannot be deducted then any other rebates and any other similar items at the time of purchase itself say government rebates for uh, any sort of purchase sort of achievement sort of rebates and incentives may be there that amount can also be deducted no other amount other than this straight discount rebate etc can be deducted cash discount etc cannot be deducted so these are all the elements for computing this purchase price so purchase price comp comprises of peculiar peculiarity all the taxes duties cesses at the time of purchase of such products goods has to be added so how do this point differ from as2 and in as2 i was mentioning in both standards may it be as2 or maybe in as2 this taxes duty assesses which are going to get subsequently recovered are not included in normal accounting terms or in terms of as2 as well as in as2 but it has to be included under this icds2 that is the most peculiarity of this icds standard so the difference with icds2 with that of as2 in as2 with regarding to inclusion of duties and taxes then how to accommodate the taxes how to include such taxes while valuing inventory and how do we make the profitability position differ so i was mentioning that this icds is only for the purpose of tax computation income tax computation apart from which for the purpose of maintenance of books for the purpose of normal financial statement preparations etc uploading etc in income tax website or any other uh, portals audit etc it should be the normal standards that has to be followed so if you include such taxes along with the the valuation of inventory that method as per this icds2 that method is termed as inclusive method and if you don't add if you don't mix taxes along with purchases cost it would be termed as normal in books exclusive method so two methods are there inclusive method as well as exclusive method so inclusive method as per icds2 we were mentioning cost of purchase should inc include the elements of duties taxes even though it is recoverable so that inclusive method so in inclusive method and exclusive method definitely yes the value of inventories would be different inclusive method would be having higher value may it be opening stock nor may be closing stock comparing to that of inclusive method in books if you follow the normal as then the value would be lesser the difference would be the tax factor 
So while preparing the books as per exclusive method, while for the purpose of valuing the inventory for taxation under inclusive method, whether there would be some difference in profitabilities, yes, there would be. If opening stock and closing stock quantity wise, if it is same, it would have been similar. But in case wherein there are difference between the level of opening stock with that of closing stock, just as if the difference of profit in costing, if you do it with absorption costing and marginal costing, there would be some difference due to that element of uh, period cost or fixed cost in inventories as if they are here. The valuation as per ICDS, if you go by that value. Would make the profit differ from that of exclusive method, which has been used while preparing the normal books of accounts. So in order to get the difference, definitely yes, you have to prepare that uh, memorandum statement. That memorandum statement showing the revenue neutrality, even though it is being uh, upward downward, next year it is going to get closing stock would automatically become opening stock. Opening stock would become the closing uh, the closing stock again. In that way, there is a revenue neutral sort of a concept. Anyhow, in order to show the same, you have to prepare a memorandum statement. So here what we are trying to do is we are just trying to elucidate how the profit would differ. When you include a tax and when you exclude the tax, that is the stock valuation as in par with ICDS standard as per the normal books or normal AS, how it would be and the memorandum statement showing the difference between the profit due to change in valuation. Also we would be discussing for that purpose. A simple, a simple illustrative example. Financial year 2018-19. Opening stock raw material quantity 100 value 10,000 rate supposing 5 percent. The tax 10,000 multiplied by 5 percent 500. So amount including tax 10,500. Purchases during the period quantity 900. Whatever unit of measurement it is 900 kilo 900 liter, whatever it is 900 quantity 90,000 the amount rate of tax again 5 percent. Total would be 94,500. This is the opening stock raw material as well as purchases during the period. And the conversion charges. Wages. Services. 50,000 30,000 for wages, no GST, no taxes. 50,000 rupees for services availed 30,000 18% 5,400. The amount would be 35,400. Then finished goods. 800 out of which. Sales. Is for 700. Then. Closing stock of finished goods is 100. Closing stock of raw material. Would be. 200. And the sales. Is at the rate of 12 percent GST or tax rate. The amount being 175,000. The amount including tax would be 196,000. So this is the total financial particulars has been given by. So opening stock is there. Purchases is there. Conversion charges as well as sales and closing stocks are also there. So what it is. So here if you see. Normal, normal books of accounts following AS exclusive method we would call. So in case of that exclusive method, if you apply those figures, opening stock 10,000, purchases, opening stock 10,000, purchases 90,000, all these things are from X, X tax columns, not including taxes, X tax columns. So opening stock 10,000, purchases. 90,000. Again, wages 50,000. Direct expenses, services availed 30,000. Then, in income side, credit side, sales 175,000. Closing stock 18,000. Finished goods, raw material 20,000. So, this is the figures as per this financial data without including taxes if we plot by. And if you balance, you would be getting gross profit to be 33,000. So simple. We just had plotted all the figures in financial particulars without including the taxes. And the gross profit here would be 33,000. Remember this figure gross profit 33,000. If you move on 
to prepare the same financial data as per ICDS2 if you prepare that is inclusive method if you prepare 145A if you prepare the opening stock value instead of 10,000 it should be 10,500. Purchases value 90,000 plus taxes instead of 90,000 it should be 94,500. Wages again 50,000, 50,000 no change. Direct expense also I was mentioning service availed here it would not be including the taxes only for cost of purchase you have to include apart from any other input services in the language of GST. If you add that amount you need not add with. So here services availed 30,000. Here 30,000 here also no change 30,000 it would be. Then. Then. The finished goods if you see finished goods if you see finished goods total sales we know ah, before finished goods sales we know 1,75,000 plus tax 1,96,000 it should be closing stock finished goods inclusive of tax 18,500 raw material 21,000 that also we have to after which we know Total out of sales. The total output tax collected is 21,000. Then. That input credit also we have to do with. And after putting those taxes along. Collected paid and all net it. Then we would be getting that gross profit. That gross profit would be 34,000, 34,000, 34,000 it would be. So that 34,000 differs from this profit as prepared earlier as per the books the profit there it was 33000 33000 so by following exclusive method it would be 33000 if you take those cost of purchases opening stock and closing stock inclusive of this taxes the value would have been 34000 so what was the reason for that 1000 rupees difference if you go by you may see the profit as per books of accounts is 33,000. And for closing inventory, here the value is 18,500, 18,000, 20,000, 21,000, and 20,000. So total difference is 1,500. 18,500 minus 18,000, 21,000 minus 20,000. So 1,500 is the value difference as far as closing inventory is concerned. Same. Opening inventory, if you see, here it is 10,500, there it is 10,000. So increase in value of opening inventory that has to be deducted. So that value would be 1,000. That 1,000 is the reason for the difference between the profit as per books, 33,000 with that of profit as per ICDS2, 34,000. So this is termed as memorandum statement. So that memorandum statement is being prepared in order to reconcile profit between exclusive method as well as inclusive method. So this is an illustration which made us knew how the profit would change if you are valuing it with ICDS2, not as per AS2. I was mentioning this ICDS2 is for the purpose of computation of income for the purpose of taxation, income tax purposes only. For that purpose, you would be preparing a table the profit as per books increase or decrease the profit due to applicability of ACDS standards may it be two three four whatever it is so those differences you have to adjust and that profit after adjustment would be made for taxability that would be the taxable profit so here you have to reconcile that profit 33,000 with that of 34,000 and it is nothing but due to that fact was that exclusive method of Inventory valuation was being followed under ICDS. Oh, sorry, inclusive method was being followed under ICDS and exclusive was being followed under books of accounts method. So this is the reconciliation memorandum statement. This is how it is exclusive as well as inclusive method are being illustrated. Then after discussing an illustration with regarding to inclusive exclusive method differences, now let us on to a small example. 
to compute the cost of inventory. ABC Limited buys goods from overseas supplier. It has recently taken delivery of 1000 units of component X. Quoted price of component X was 1200 per unit, but ABC has negotiated trade discount of 5% due to the size of order. So here we were mentioning the trade discount element can be reduced. So definitely yes, from that 1200 to be the unit value, you can deduct 5% and the remaining amount only would be forming part of cost of purchases. Then there the supplier offers an early settlement discount 2%. So it is nothing but a cash discount. So the question is whether that cash discount has to be excluded if you go by the standard we were mentioning the paragraph says that only trade discount can be deducted, no other type of discounts. So this 2% discount we cannot deduct. Then at the time of purchase, there was some inboard duties, basic customs duty 60 per unit for 1000 units may be paid before the goods are released through custom. Once the goods are released through customs, ABC must pay the delivery cost. Delivery cost meaning the transportation cost from port, airport to the factory gate. 5000 rupees. So how much the value of cost of purchase for that cost of inventory? We know out of the total purchase price 1200 you can reduce 5 percentage. So 95 percentage of the same. You may reduce 5 percentage of 1200 into 1000 also here. Net rate we are taking 1000 into 1200 into 95 percentage 11 lakh 40 thousand it would be. Import duties would be 1000 into 60. Then delivery cost also has to be added. Here I was mentioning the settlement discount. That cash discount portion would not be reduced. The cost of purchase, the cost of inventory would be 12 lakh 5000 in this instant example. Then after the first element for the cost of inventory, now let us move on to the second term. The second term being cost of conversion. Cost of conversion, we were mentioning any other cost in order to convert this raw material to its finished goods form. Cost directly related to units of production, direct expenses, as well as indirect ones. So, indirect ones, we usually call it to be overheads. And in uh, some slides back, I was trying to mention you with regarding to fixed type of overhead as well as uh, variable types of overhead. So that uh, fixed overhead as well as variable overhead on the basis of capacity utilization I was mentioning it has to be proportionately bifurcated. So how to do it? How to tackle that fixed overhead apportionment etc. We would be discussing in the later slides illustration examples we are having. So what is cost of conversion? Cost directly, cost indirectly in relation to production. Direct thing just we have to add it with. Then with regarding to indirect ones, what should we have to? Overheads separately divided into two, three categories. Semi variable I was mentioning. Among that semi variable, fixed portion towards fixed, variable towards variable. So only two types of overheads, fixed production as well as variable production overheads. So I was mentioning how to apportion this fixed overhead. Fixed production overheads shall be those indirect cost of production that remain relatively constant regardless of that volume of production. Then variable production overhead shall be those indirect cost of production that vary directly or nearly directly with the volume of production. The basic definition also we know the standard prescripts same too. The allocation of fixed production overhead for the purpose of their inclusion in the cost of conversion shall be based on normal capacity again do I repeat on the basis of normal capacity of the production facility. So what is the normal capacity? We know the capacity installed one normally how how, how much we can use how, how much we can utilize would be termed to be as normal capacity. It would vary. So on the basis of previous figures on the basis of the factory installed capacity on the basis of uh, achievable capacity and all we would be required to compute this normal capacity. So definitely yes, that uh, uh, discriminative power, discretionary power of the cost accountant has to be inserted to know about that normal capacity. So on that basis of normal capacity alone, this fixed production overhead has to be absorbed. Absorbed. So how to absorb it? Normal capacity I was mentioning shall be the production expected to be achieved on average number of 
periods of season under normal circumstances taken into account the loss of capacity resulting from planned maintenance. So planned maintenance sort of capacity time period you can reduce. The actual level of production shall be used when it approximates to normal capacity. The amount of fixed production overhead allocated to each unit of production shall not be increased as consequence of low production or idle plan. So I was mentioning if it is par with the normal, lesser than normal, then the amount of fixed overhead should be same. It should not be increased. Unallocated overhead shall be recognized as an expense in the period in which they are incurred. In period of abnormally high production, the amount of fixed production overhead allocated to each unit is decreased so that inventory are not measured above that cost. Variable production overhead shall be assigned to each unit of production on the basis of actual use of production facility. So there are no confusions, dilemmas as far as variable production overheads are concerned. Variable production overheads, how much it has been actually incurred, it would be automatically absorbed. But in case of fixed overhead only, this normal capacity sort of apportionment you would be required to do by. So to avoid the confusions, a simple illustration has been plotted in your screen. So in that uh, illustrative example, there are three cases, three situations and on each situations, how the fixed overhead would be absorbed, we can evaluate. So Pluto Limited, the name of the firm, name of the company has a planned with normal capacity, 5 lakh unit of product per annum and the expected fixed overhead is 15 lakh, 15 lakh. So the total fixed cost expected for as far as overheads are concerned is 15 lakh and the normal capacity is 5 lakh unit. The fixed overhead on the basis of normal capacity is 15 lakh divided by 5 we know per unit it would be 3 per unit it would be 3. Normal capacity would be the denominator normal fixed cost would be the numerator. Then case number one actual production par with normal production. It was 5 lakh unit only, 5 lakh unit only. So how much would be the fixed cost per unit, fixed overhead per unit, fixed on the basis of normal capacity and actual overheads will lead to same figure 15 lakh. Therefore, it is advisable to include this on normal capacity. So it would be this much only. But in case wherein, but in case wherein, the actual production is 3.75 lakh. Actual production is 3.75 lakh, which is below, beneath, lesser than that of normal capacity 5 lakh unit. So if the actual production is less than 5 lakh unit, 3.75 lakh, then the fixed overhead is not going to change with change in output and will remain constant at 15 lakh. Therefore, the overhead on actual basis should have been 15 lakh divided by 3.75 lakh, 4 lakh per unit. Hence, by valuing inventory at four, each for a fixer overhead purpose, it will be overvalued and losses. 3,75,000 will be included in the closing stock, leading to higher gross profit than that of actually earned. So therefore, it is advisable to include the fixed overhead per unit on normal capacity to actual production. And the balance 3,75,000 shall be transferred to profit and loss account as an expense. So this is the uh, critical or this is the crucial point that has to be borne in mind while valuing the inventory. My dear professional colleagues, my dear August audience, at the time of valuation of inventory in situation in our instant example, case number two. So what does case number two prescribe? The case number two says that the total production is less than the normal capacity. Here the normal capacity is 5 lakh unit and we are having the actual capacity product actual production of 3 lakh 75,000. So in normal cases total fixed cost divided by normal capacity units 3 rupee per unit should have been the actual cost. But if instead of going for that 3, if you directly divide 15 lakh with that of actual production 3 lakh 75,000 per unit value would be 4. So what would happen here? There are chances that there are no chances. There is a chance that there is. The excess overhead which are not being absorbed would be included in the value of inventory also. Why? Because per unit would be 4 per unit. 
So in order to avoid that situation, in order to make the closing inventory not to be an inflated one, what we are trying to do, instead of absorbing it at four per unit, it should be three. In the remaining loss, it would be directly transferred to P&L account as an expense. It would not change the cost of production value, nor it would do it would not change what the cost of inventory in hand in stock closing inventory also. So this is case number two. So the fundamental difference is the normal capacity less than normal capacity. Normal capacity per unit cost should be there. It should not be increased due to decrease in quantity of production. We know the quantity of production decreases per unit value would increase. So that increase in value due to decrease in production should not happen. Simple case number two. Case number three. Case number three talks about. Production higher than that of normal capacity. So if you produce more than normal capacity here in this instant case, case number three, you may see actual production is 7,50,000 units, 7,50,000 units. So that 7,50,000 units fixed overheads is not going to change with the change in output and remain constant would be 15 lakh. Therefore, overhead actual basis would be two only, would be two only. Hence, by valuing inventory at three for fixed overhead, we will be adding the inventory of cost to inventory, which will be actually has not been incurred at three per unit. So the total fixed overhead comes to 22,50,000 in case wherein if you are putting it to be three per unit. So in order to avoid that dilemma. So normal capacity per se, it should have been three per unit. But here it is actually if you see, if you divide the total fixed cost with that of actual production, it is two only. Still, if you stick on with what three per unit in case number one, as far well as in case number two, we were sticking on to uh, unit value three per unit. If you stick on with that a value, there would be. Increase in the profit due to this uh, or closing stock being overvalued at three per unit. So thereby at three per unit, the total fixer of cost would become 22,50,000, whereas actual fixer cost expenses is only 1,50,000. Therefore, it's advisable to include fixer overhead on an actual basis. So in short, three situations. Situation number one, normal capacity. Total overheads fixed divided by normal capacity units. Actual capacity less than normal capacity. There also case number one you have to follow. Wherein total fixed cost divided by normal capacity units to be the denominator, not what actual capacity to be the numerator. Third situation. If the actual capacity utilized is more than that of normal capacity, first and second situation you shouldn't follow. You have to divide the total fixed cost by the actual number of units produced, and that should be used in order to value what inventory. So these are the three peculiar situations that has to be strictly adhered in order to value the inventory as per ICDS number two. So this is how you have to do it. Again, at the cost of repetition, but quite quite an relevant point. That's why I'm repeating the point again. Three situations, one and two can be clubbed together at normal capacity, the actual production, less than normal capacity, the actual production, normal capacity related per unit cost you have to do. If the total actual production is more than that of normal capacity, then the normal units you have to put it as the denominator in order to divide what the fixer overhead. Simple, simple, simple. So I do hope this uh, Fixed overhead production overhead concept, how to absorb to that uh, inventory is clear to you all. Then another example. This conversion cost. This is nothing to do with uh, this point. Uh, now onto that. Yes, to the conversion cost point again to repeat with uh, illustration number two for conversion cost. Business plans for uh, production overhead of uh, 10 lakh per annum. So the total production overhead is 10 lakh. Normal level of production is. 1 lakh unit per annum. So this is a normal capacity, 1 lakh units. Due to supply difficulties, the business was able to make 75,000 units in current year. Other cost per unit were 126. So how to apportion this production overhead? Presume the total overhead, 10 lakh is fixed overhead only, fixed overhead only. So how to compute the cost per unit if you go by? 
other cost may it be material labor whatever it is it is one two six and under and 26 the other cost then comes production overhead i was mentioning the normal level of production is one lakh the actual production is lesser than that of normal production 75000 so 10 lakh divided by 70000 we should not it should have been 10 lakh divided by 1 lakh 10 per unit it should have been so it should be 136 and the remaining amount you have to uh, counted in the pnl account at the time of preparing statement of pnl account 2.5 lakh we have to use then here that uh, inventory should not be bearing that extra burden and that amount has to be debited separately to profitability statement so this is nothing but an extension of the previous three situations this situation again the actual capacity is less than normal capacity so that differential portion should not affect the stock valuation now after discussing cost of purchase how to include the taxes and all we went on to discuss with cost of conversion special focus was been assigned to fixed overhead after which now we are moving on to the next arena how to value joint product how to value a by product definitely yes we know what a joint product is so at that joint product sort of a planned if you are going to prepare this form 6c you are going to value the inventory then yes we should have fundamental knowledge about that uh, production process procedure <coughs> you should be in a position to know technically where that technical split of point is pre separation cost as well as post separation cost is and on that rationale consistently we would be required to apportion such cost byproduct also we know byproduct is a product which is in nature of scrap waste etc which would not be having the value as if its main product is so usually usually the total sale value net realizable value less that cost of main product we would be uh, reducing in order to find out the from from the cost of main product we would be reducing the net realizable value of byproduct in order to compute the profitability one among the method so usually net realizable value would be the value of such byproducts and in order to compute the profitability we would be reducing the value of that byproducts from the total cost of production in order to get the cost of production of main product. Illustrative example. Manufacturing process of mass limited. One by one byproduct BP. Emerges besides two main product. Main product one MP1. Main product two MP2. Apart from the scrap that we were mentioning BP byproduct. Details of cost of production are here under. Raw material. 1400 unit. Amount 150,000. Wages 90,000. Fixed overhead 65,000. Variable overhead 50,000. Output main product 1 5,000 unit. Closing stock in hand 250. Main product 2 4,000 units. And closing stock in hand 100. By product. 2000 units were been emerged during the process. So, how to account, how to value this main product as well as by product? By product, we were mentioning there is no point of closing stock in hand. It has to be reduced from the value of uh, cost of production for producing the main products we were mentioning. One among the method. The average market price of MP1 and MP2 is 60 and 50. So, this is the criteria used in order to bifurcate uh, such cost. By product is sold at 20 per unit. There is a profit of 5000 on sale of byproduct after including separate processing charge 8000 and packaging charge 2000 5000 was released from the sale of scrap. Then calculate also apart from that uh, byproduct is scrap is also there. Calculate the value of closing stock MP1 and MP2. So how to compute? First one. We are uh, trying to calculate the net realizable value of byproduct uh, BP. Selling price we were mentioning. Selling price would be. Uh, yes, 40,000, 2000 multiplied by 2000 was the total production and the unit price of selling it would be 20. 2000 multiplied by 20, it would be 40,000. Then there are 
certain charges also. So it has to be reduced. Then only, then only we would be deriving at uh, net reversible value. So it is 2000 and 8000. So that 2000 and 8000 you have to reduce. The net reversible value would be 30,000. And that 30,000 we would be reducing here for uh, reducing it from the total cost of production for manufacturing two main products. That value we would be reducing from here. This is value 30,000. So this 30,000 is nothing but sale value minus cost for selling the same by reducing such cost to make it that point of sale. 8,000, 2,000 was there. So if you reduce this 10,000 with from this 40,000, the net regressible value would be 30,000. That 30,000 we would be reducing while computing the total cost for manufacturing main product one and main product number two. So to compute the cost of MP1 and MP2, raw material 150,000, wages 90,000, Fixed cost 65,000, presuming the normal capacity has been used. Variable overhead 50,000. And you reduce this 30,000 plus some scrap sale is also there. 5,000 is there. So that scrap sale also you are reducing. The joint cost is 3,20,000. So that 3,20,000 on the basis of this unit's output and sell price. So that would be the ratio. 5,000 into 60, 4,000 into 50. 3 is to 2 would be the ratio. So this total cost of 3,20,000, you have to proportion, apportion with this ratio 3 is to 2. So it would be 1,92,000 and 1,28,000. So cost per unit would be 38.4 and 32. So total closing stock units, MP1, main product 1, it was 5,000. Main product 2, it was 4,000. So if you multiply this cost of production per unit, you would be getting the value of stock. So this is the basic idea. How we would be doing it for joint products as well as byproducts. So these columns are also there in your form 60. Some more modifications are required. Definitely, yes, we have to definitely proactively evaluate so-called draft 60 because it is in its draft stage. So we as practicing professionals, we have to apply the mind. What are all the things which are going to happen in future? What are all the practical situations which may arise? So any columns, any points to be added, to be deleted, to be amended. Proactively, we have to evaluate and we have to make our suggestions to the department. Then only it would be included at the time of actual implementation of that form, form number 6C. Anyhow, for the time being, this is how we are trying to do with this joint products as well as by products. Then after this joint product and byproduct, we are moving on to other cost. Other cost includes cost of inventories only to the extent that they are incurred in bringing the inventories to their present location. Meaning what? Any other cost other than that of this cost of purchase and conversion cost. Say for example, administrative cost or in case of interest cost, finance cost, etc. So standard is quite specific. Standard is quite specific. Interest cost in any other sort of such borrowing cost shall not be included to the cost of inventories unless they meet the criteria for the recognition of interest as a component of cost as specified in ICDS on borrowing cost. So ICDS for borrowing cost specifies the asset or a stock to be Qualified asset. So in case wherein it is classified to be as a qualified asset, then only this borrowing cost can be included along with that inventory value or fixed asset value. So only in such cases, interest and borrowing cost should form part of value of inventory. Apart from which, how and what are all the situations wherein borrowing cost can be added, we would be discussing tomorrow. Before which, just make it understand that, understood that. Any of such interest or such a borrowing cost which is not to get included, specifically it should be excluded. So that other cost should not include what? Interest or any other borrowing cost. Say, if it is to be included, then only it has to be. A dealer has purchased 1000 cars costing 2,80,000 each on deferred payment basis as 25,000 per month per car to be paid in. 12 equal installments. So here 
he is a car dealer. Car is their inventory, not a fixed asset. And the total cost of car is price of that car is two lakh eighty thousand each. And instead of making the single payment to purchase of such cars, it is on installment basis, which is to be paid in twelve equal installments. So, presuming the borrowing cost is standard under ICDS, agrees that this can be added along with inventory. How to value that inventory is in stock if you go by the total cash price is so twenty five thousand multiplied by twelve. Then uh, deferred payment price, cash price is two lakh eighty thousand. We have to pay how much? Twenty five thousand multiplied by twelve installments. So the payment actually made is twenty five thousand multiplied by twelve would be three lakh. The actual cash price would have been two lakh eighty thousand. So the interest expense would be twenty thousand. So here, how to compute the cost of inventory? The cost of inventory should be twenty car multiplied by two lakh eighty fifty six plus the finance cost also has to be. Added. This is how you are computing what cost of goods sold. So in short, if such finance cost has to be added as per borrowing cost ICD standard, then only we can add it. Otherwise, that borrowing cost should not be included while valuing the inventory. Yes, on a comprehensive example, by taking into account all the above mentioned points, if you go by, we may see valuation of closing inventory. Cost of company amounted to nine lakh fifty six thousand seven hundred. The following items were included at cost in total: three fifty shirts, which had cost of three eighty each, and normally sold for seven fifty. So two products are there: first product shirt, second product trousers. The shirts three fifty shirts cost three eighty, sales price seven fifty. Owing to defect in manufacture, they were all sold. After the balance sheet date, at the rate of 50% of the normal price. So instead of 750, half the rate has been the selling price. Selling expenses, 5% of the proceed. That also has to be incurred. Then in case of trousers, 700 trousers, which had the cost rupees 520. These two were found to be defective. Selling expense total 3800. They were sold for 950 each. Calculate the inventory value is the question. So how to compute shirts? If you go by the value of shirt, we know total 350 units. Cost is 380. But the net realizable value, net realizable value, how much it would become? Net realizable value, you may see, you are going to fetch only 50% of normal price I was mentioning. So how much it would be? Instead of 750. 750 is 50% would be the selling price multiplied by 350. Whether that selling price is net realizable value? No, it is not. To make it for that purpose of sale, there are further incremental cost amounting to 5% of the total value. So that 5% has to be reduced. So it would be 1,24,688. So the value of cost, other than that of net realizable value, if you see, the right and down value should have been. Eight thousand three twelve, eight thousand three twelve. So that eight thousand three twelve, let it be there. The differential value between stock at cost and net realizable value of shirts. Then comes the cost of trousers. Cost of trousers. The cost of trousers. It was five twenty each. So five twenty multiplied by this amount. Seven hundred trousers, three lakh sixty four thousand. Again here. There are net realizable value for the trousers. They were sold for 950 each. 950 each. So their the estimated selling price is 950, and selling price is 3800. So 3800 divided by 700 trousers would be 5.43. Net realizable value per unit would be 944.57. So here the value would be the lowest of cost or net realizable value. Therefore, five uh, twenty would be per unit would be the value for carrying the amount as far as trousers are concerned. Since the inventory is carried on at cost, there is no further adjustment required there. But here, if you see the total value of inventory given, it is nine lakh fifty six thousand seven hundred, wherein there should be a differential figure. Why? Because at cost only you had given what nine lakh fifty seven thousand six hundred seven hundred. So here there should be a distinction. One lakh twenty-four thousand eight six eighty-eight should have been 
instead of this 1,33,000. So the difference is 8,312. So here instead of 957,700, this differential figure 8,312 also has to be deducted. But whether such difference is there in case of trousers, it is not so. Why? Because this cost 8,956,700 9, is inclusive of cost of trousers also. Here the trouser being the lowest cost, there should not be. There need not be any reduction in the value of cost comparing to that of NRV. Thereby the trousers would have an indifferent impact as far as this cost would be concerned. So that uh, 9,56,700 has to be deducted with this 8,312 and the revised inventory value should have been 948388 instead of 956700. So this is an illustrative example how the closing stock value has to be deferred by implementing this ICDS. That is by comparing NRV with that of cost, whichever is lower, that figure should have been taken in order to compute what the inventory. This is a practical example which elucidates that instead of taking this book value, it should have been this value. Why? Because due to this difference that the cost was above the NRV, NRV should have been the cost. Instead, the book value took the cost. The differential portion you have to reduce in order to get what the value par with ICDS standard. Yes. Then the next term being cost of services. So I was mentioning this cost of services again is a peculiar item which do have got a different meaning or uh, which do have got a different content other than that of the normal AS or India AS standards. So what does this cost of service mean? The cost of service are comprised of labor and other cost of personnel directly engaged in providing the service, including supervisory personnel and attributable overheads. So all those labor elements, all those human elements directly or indirectly shall also be formed part of the cost. So this comprises of the fourth element. The first element cost of purchase we were already discussing. Second point with regarding to conversion cost also done understood. Other costs also we had mentioned. Apart from this, all the labor sort of cost also has to be included. All these four elements would be added up together in order to get the cost of inventory part. Cost of inventory part. So these four parts. Cost of purchase, peculiarity, I was mentioning it should be including duties, taxes, even though it is going to get uh, recredited. Then cost of conversion we were mentioning, fixed overhead, how to absorb we were discussing. Then we were discussing about uh, other cost perspective, borrowing cost and all we were discussing. Cost of service also would be compared, would, be, would have to be combined in order to get the value of inventory, cost to value of inventory. Cost conversion comparison, Actual level of production may be used if it is approximates normal capacity. So in different ICDS used as a capacity. Then exclusions from the cost of inventories. Exclusions from the cost of inventory. I was mentioning in order to determine the cost of inventory, the following cost shall have to be excluded and recognized as expense of the following period in which it has been incurred. So what are all the things which has to be excluded? First and foremost thing, quite an important item abnormal wastage abnormal wastage this point definitely do have got some more things to get discussed quite an important point so for that discussing that abnormal wastage we would be discussing as part of tomorrow's discussion for the time being what does the term abnormal wastage mean abnormal wastage simply means in case of a manufacturing process there is a ratio input output ratio this much units of input should fetch this much an output. Say one kilo of output input should get 900 grams of output. So we know that 100 grams is normal loss. But if you only get 850 grams output from that 1000 grams of input, keeping apart that 1000 gram, 100 grams of normal loss, the remaining 50 grams, 900 minus 850 actual 50 grams would be treated as abnormal wastage that abnormal wastage of material as if abnormal wastage of labor too. this much quantity of labor timekeeping time booking etc those concepts in labor accounting we had already learned so in that difference between the actual productivity from labor with that of expected or normal sort of capacity 
if there are negligible or uh, acceptable tolerable idleness that can be forming part of the inventory but there are abnormal sort of idle abnormal not of wastage as far as labor is concerned or any other sort of direct cost whatever it is maybe electricity maybe consumables all those things those abnormal costs should not be portioning in the total normal cost of production as well as the standards is also very strict that that amount of abnormality should not be forming part of cost of inventories also then storage cost storage cost is includable if it is the process for the further production stage other than that of if it is stored for, for other than that of for a further production stage any other storage cost would not be added then administrative cost would be added as if it will have got the direct nexus direct connection direct correlation with the production if it doesn't have got that direct uh, co correlation nexus with that of production it should not be included as if selling cost selling cost is after the production stage so it would be after the cost of production stage thereby it also would not be forming part of cost of inventories so these four types of exclusions are there this four out of which I was mentioning that abnormal wastage, how to compute abnormal wastage and all we would be discussing tomorrow. So for the time being, these many things A, B, C and D have to be excluded while valuing the cost of inventories. Yes, a simple example, direct material cost 100 per kilo, direct labor cost 20 per kilo, direct variable production overhead, fixed production overhead I was mentioning, that has to be as per the normal capacity value of the inventory just adding up value of industry codes would be 2 lakh 80 thousand plus then can g limited a wire netting company while valuing is finished goods at the end include interest on bank overdraft as an element of cost for the reason that overdraft has been taken specifically for the purpose of financing current assets like inventory and for meeting day-to-day -day working expenses here i was mentioning the borrowing cost can be included only if the borrowing cost standard specifies it to be included when it would be specified we would be discussing it later tomorrow we would be discussing that the borrowing cost icds so at the time of discussing that standard we would be knowing when and where you have to include here in this example it should not be included thereby the contention of g limited is not at all tenable so by understanding the total cost that uh, total cost formula how to compute that total cost there are various techniques for calculating cost the standards mentions about four types four types can be used in order to compute the cost first one the standards prescribe that situation wherein the inputs are not interchangeable if the outputs can be specifically identifiable that is nothing is homogeneous in nature every output requires a different set of inputs in such case instead of using the normal way of FIFO, FIFO, etc. You have to specifically identify what are all the materials included in order to manufacture or to assemble that a product, and you have to implement specific identification of cost method. So this is the first method that the standard prescribes. Whether this specific cost identification method is applicable to all inventories, it is not. The fundamental presumption to apply specific identification of cost method is the cost of inventories of items are not ordinarily interchangeable and goods or services are segregated for specific projects. We know different types of valves, butterfly valves or specific type of products for specific type of customers, tailor made products non-homogeneous product would be there so in order to value the inventory for such a specific sort of investment industry then 
the method that has to be adopted is specific identification of cost. So there the role of cost accountant in such industries would be to compute the cost of inventory from raw material part. How much raw material, what raw material, how much quantity, how much rate, etc. you have to that raw material cost only should be absorbed for computing the finished goods as if the labor part as if any other cost of conversion as if consumables as if any other uh, products or services used in order to manufacture the same so specifically we would be required to identify so first technique first method would be the cost of inventories which are not ordinarily interchangeable so those products which are not specific uh, which can be which cannot be segregated for specified projects in such cases the first and foremost should be specific identification so specific identification simply mean the raw material required to manufacture that finished goods consumables used in order to manufacture the same so all those things in specific you have to find out and that amount has to be used in order to value the inventories under this first method it is nothing but specific identification of cost method in as2 and in as2 there are no such a distinction then if that specific identification method is not possible in almost all industries it need not be the products everyone heterogeneous in nature in industries wherein you are having the products the inputs are being interchangeably used in such cases, you may use either FIFO first in first out method or you may use weighted average cost formula. So we know how to do with the valuation under FIFO and weighted average. So keeping apart those peculiar industry wherein heterogeneous in nature, the remaining almost all you may use either FIFO as well as weighted average cost formula in order to value what this inventory so what is this FIFO we know anyhow the standard says the cost of inventories other than the inventory delta under specific identification shall be assigned by using FIFO or weighted average cost formula the formula used shall reflect the fairest possible appropriation approximation to the cost incurred in bringing the items of inventory to their present location and position the FIFO formula assumes that the items of inventory which were purchased or produced first are consumed or sold first and consequently the items remaining the inventory at the end of the period are those most recently purchased or produced so FIFO we know first in first out so it is presumed that when it is been purchased it are been it is been used for the purpose of production upfront and the remaining in the close closing stock closing inventory in hand is are from the recent purchases only recent inward issues only so in that way FIFO method is being used so the value would be from the recent purchases only totally an average sort of period may it be a month may it be a year half yearly basis if you are doing it then instead of the last sort of purchase price if it is on an average basis it would be termed as weighted average cost formula the cost of each item is determined from the weighted average of cost of similar item at the beginning of period and the cost of similar items purchased or produced during the period the average shall be calculated on a periodic basis or as such additional shipment is received depending upon the circumstances so how to compute it fifo method simple illustration simple illustration how to do it for items first item unit purchased on april 1 1000 units at the rate of 2 so balance is uh, 1000 april 12th th 3000 units at the rate of 2.2 4000 april 17 2000 sold so the remaining would be 2000 units 4000 minus 2000 units issued 2000 would be the balance april 30th 1000 units 2.4 so the balance would be 3000 so how to presume this 3000 you have to presume this 3000 from that of 1000 units which was purchased on april 30th and 2000 unit as purchased on April 12th. So you have to presume out of the 2000 units sold on April 17, it was from April 1st, then from April 12th. 1000 from April 1 and 1000 from 
April 12, 3000 lot. So that was been issued first in first out method was been issued in April 17th. You have to presume. So the remaining inventory amounting to 3000 unit, it would be from 1000 units at 2.4 purchaser in April 30th and the remaining 2000 would be from the lot purchaser on April the 12th. So if you put the figures on April 12th and April 30th, the value would be 4400 and uh, 2400. The total cost of inventory would be 4400 plus 2400 would be 6800. So miniature formula we know I know anyhow for the sake of this session only I was mentioning how to compute it under FIFO. This is how to value the inventory under FIFO method. Then weighted average. Same example. If you put on April 30th, we are having 3000 units. So you have to take the average value, average value, average value. So that average value, how it is being computed? 2000 into 2.15. How that 2.15 is? That has to be computed as per that uh, 3000 plus 1000. That value plus 1000 into 2.4 as such. 2.23 it can be or directly 1000 into 2 plus 3000 into 2.2. That is the remaining this thing. We would pay 4000, 2.15 also. So here we are taking it to be as a simple average on 2.23 basis. And on that basis, 2.23, if you value what? 3000 units, the total cost would be 6700. So this is the basic table computing the value under weighted average. So simple FIFO method as well as weighted average method. This is how the second option would be. First option I was already mentioning, it should be specific identification of cost. So if it is not applicable, if it is interchangeable, if the products are homogeneous, then you may go for FIFO as well as weighted average formula. Then two more methods. The standard says it can be either standard cost method as well as retail method. Two more methods the standard prescribes. The techniques for measurement of cost of inventory such as the standard cost for or the retail method may be used for the convenience if results approximate the actual cost. So that is again the discretionary power of the valuer. So if it approximates the actual cost, instead of actually absorbing it, it can be on an estimated basis also. I was mentioning earlier also. So first among the method being standard cost method, standard cost, standard cost it can be also it can be the retail method. So what is the retail method we would be discussing anyhow? First of all, standard cost. Standard cost we know, standard cost taken into account normal level of consumption of material and supplies, labor efficiency and capacity utilization. They are regularly reviewed and if any necessary revised in the light of current conditions, we can do it. So on that basis of standards only, we can have the cost of inventory to be valued. Any differences, it would be adjusted accordingly. So standard cost, this is just as if we are having such a standard cost on materials, standard cost on labor expenses, etc. You would be absorbing the cost towards valuing the inventory. Then what is this uh, retail method? So in uh, some situations, it would be impracticable to go for uh, FIFO and uh, weighted average because the number of raw material or the numerous number of raw materials, consumables or uh, spares would be there. So it would be impracticable. Thousands, lakhs and uh, numbers of these things would be there. So it would be quite impracticable to follow FIFO method or weighted average. Nowadays, after this technological advancement and all, possible extent, definitely yes, we can account it with uh, this enterprise resource planning, ERP softwares and all. But anyhow, in such situations, if it is not uh, practicable to follow with uh, FIFO and uh, weighted average, we may use retail method, retail method for measuring inventories also, which are having similar margins. Margin is nothing but the gross profit. The cost plus gross profit would be the selling price. So that similar margin, if they are having, then instead of uh, going for this FIFA and uh, weighted average Cuba some situations definitely yes this retail method is being made acceptable by ICDS2 standard also. 
The cost of inventory is determined by reducing from the sale value of inventory the appropriate percentage gross margin. The percentage used takes into consideration the inventory which has been marked down to below its original selling price. So there from that selling price, the estimated selling price of that inventory, that raw material, that finished goods, work in progress, whatever it is, from that amount you have to reduce what? Okay. The margin, gross profit margin, then that differential amount would be treated as the value of inventory as far as this method, retail method is concerned. So how this AS2 or Inda AS2 speaks about this retail method? Adjusting sale value by appropriate percentage gross margin is general approach permitted and average percentage for each retail department is often used. So same method is being adopted by AS2 as well as India AS2 also. So in retail method, what to be done? Simply you just reduce what? Gross margin from selling price and illustration. Trousers Limited is a dealer of clothes and has thousands of items in its inventories. It applies the retail method. The average gross margin is 20%. So you have to make it assured it should be similar margin for those products. The sale price of the trousers of carton of 20 trousers is 10,000. So how to value it? Accordingly, each carton would be valued at 8,000. Why? The 10,000, the total minus what? The margin. The selling price would be the 10,000 minus what? Margin. It would be 8,000. So total 20 trousers are there. So per trouser, the value would be 400 each. So by reducing the margin, from that of selling price, if you are deriving at the value, that value would be termed as retail method of valuation. Retail method of valuation, retail method of valuation, very much acceptable method in case wherein you feel FIFO and weighted average method is impracticable to use by. Impracticable to use by. Yes, so this many things up to cost we were discussing, up to cost. Then Paragraph number three, we know cost or net realizable value, whichever is lower shall be the value of uh, inventory we were mentioning. So up to now, we had uh, discussed various elements of cost. Out of those uh, varial, various elements of cost, cost of purchase, peculiarity, including taxes, how to absorb uh, cost of uh, Fixed overheads, all those things we were discussing. Uh, till now, any doubts? If you feel, definitely yes. You may text in that uh, chat box question and answer. Option would be there. So, any doubts? Till now, in case of cost related queries, cost, how to compute the cost for inventories or any other things with relating to ICDS2, definitely you may make uh, that point uh, to be mentioned in your question and answer box. Those questions definitely would be answered today if possible. Otherwise, tomorrow session would be beginning or at the end we would be clearing those doubts. So any doubts, kindly use the opportunity, kindly do text it in that uh, question and answer box. I do request uh, the TRA department, the Pradada sir to Copy that uh, things from question and answer box and to mail me so that I would be answering all those queries tomorrow. So question and answer box is open to you all. Yes, Back sir, to the topic. Sir, we will be mailing the question. Till now we have not received any questions. Yes, sir. One, any any questions? Question. Any questions from August? Any questions from August audience? I am requesting them to make it in that question and answer. All the answers we would be discussing or would be giving the answers tomorrow. Okay. Sure, sir. Okay. So this with regarding to cost. Now after discussing the cost, now let us move on to discuss with the next term, net realizable value. So NRV, inventory shall be written down to net realizable value on item by item basis. Quite an important thing. Instead of having it on a gross basis, item by item basis, we have to write down that uh, net realizable value where the items of inventory relating to the same product line having similar purpose or end uses are produced and marketed in the same geographical area and cannot be practically evaluated, evaluated separately from other items in that product line. Such inventory shall be grouped together and returned down to the net realizable value on an aggregate basis. So apart from this and specific situation, if much possible, definitely yes, the inventories has to be written, uh, valued on 
item by item basis, line to line basis, not on consolidated aggregate basis. Then the net releasable value shall be based on the most reliable evidence available at the time of valuation. The estimates of net releasable value shall also take into consideration the purpose for which inventory is held. The estimates shall take into consideration fluctuations of price or cost directly relating to event occurring after the end of previous year to the extent that such events confirmation the conditions existed on the light of previous year. So this net releasable value we know it should not be par with that of fair market value. Fair market value is a different concept I was mentioning. Fair market value meaning two unrelated buyers wherein in an open market at arm's length basis, what would be the price should have been termed to be as fair market value. But here it is not fair market value, rather the term used here is net realizable value. Net realizable value meaning on the basis of consideration of the market, the price fluctuations, the cost, etc. And on the basis of previous experiences, we are estimating the price at which it can be sold by. And from that estimated selling price, we have to reduce the incremental cost in order to make such products appear to the market. So if you reduce that an incremental cost from that of uh, finished product sales value, the differential portion would be termed as net realizable value. So that net realizable value, the materials and any other supplies held for use in the production of inventory shall not be written down below the cost where the finished products in the uh, in which they shall be incorporated are expected to be sold or at above the cost. So quite an important point in this paragraph, the materials, even though the materials cost, then the net realizable value of the material, say the material was bought at 10 rupee per kilo. Now the value of material is 8, net realizable value is expected to be 8. So whether it should be written down to 8, if you ask, the answer is if the finished product by using this raw material is not having that reduction of net realizable value as happened to that raw material. Then in such case, even though the net realizable value has been lower than that of this cost, that should not be taken into account. That has to be as per cost itself. Then whether there are decline in price of material and it's estimated that the cost of finished goods will exceed the net realizable value. The value of material shall be written down to the net realizable value, which shall be replacement of such cost. So it should be on replacement cost basis. If there is a decline in price of material and still the cost of finished goods will exceed the net realizable value, then it should be on replacement cost basis. Example. At the end of financial year, Company P has 100 units of inventory on hand recorded at a carrying cost of 10 per unit. Current market price is 8 per unit and which at which these units can be sold. Company P has the firm sale contract with uh, company Q to sell 60 units at 11 per unit, which cannot be settled in net. Estimated incremental selling price is 1 per unit. So in this question, Inventory in hand 100, the cost was 10, but now the current market price is 8. So the question is whether it has to be written down to 8. Company has a sale contract 60 unit at 11 per unit, which cannot be settled in it. Estimated incremental selling cost is 1 per unit. So what is happening here? While performing NRV test, the NRV of 60 units that will be sold to company Q is 10 per unit, 11 minus 1 NRV would have been 10. NRV of remaining unit is 7 per unit, 8 minus 1. Therefore, company P will return down those remaining 40 units by 120. The total cost of inventory would be goods to be sold. 60 units multiplied by 10 would be 600. The remaining goods, 40 units into 7 would be 280. But in case wherein, Using such an inventory, if you are manufacturing a product which is not going to reduce the value, then instead wherein it has been reduced to be 8, it should not have been taken into account. But in this question, there is no clue whether 
using that I think whether there is an uh, amount of deduction or change in case of uh, the finished product which is being used. If the total finished goods value doesn't change, then the value of raw material also should not have been changed by. Here you may see business has four types of inventory. Count of inventory has been established that the amount of inventory currently held and cost are as follows. A1, A2, B1, C1. A1 cost 8000 estimated selling price 7800 selling cost. So only thing is selling price minus selling cost would be the NRV value NRV value. So likewise A1, A2, B1, C1 are being given. So item of cost A1 cost is 8000, 14000, 16000, 6000. Here NRV would be 7300, 17800, 16800 and 7350. We know the cost or NRV whichever is lower. In first case, it is NRV 7300. Second case cost 14,000. Third case cost again 16,000. Fourth two cost 6,000. This is how you would be doing it. The value of inventory inventory on line by line basis. So this is how the NRV value would be the different high time. What do you call complex sort of situations we would be discussing tomorrow. Today just the basics. The cost we had discussed already. The second thing that we had discussed is with regarding to NRV. So simple NRV or cost whichever is lower also has been elucidated. After discussing the fundamental paragraph, paragraph number three and talking about various elements of cost and talking about NRV and NRV or cost whichever is lower. Now the standard slowly moves towards valuation of opening inventory, valuation of opening inventory. So usually opening inventory would be nothing but the value as if the closing inventory for the previous period would be. So standard ICDS specifies various situations to value opening inventory. The value of inventory as on the beginning of the previous year shall be the cost of inventory available if any on the day of commencement of business when the business has commenced during the previous year and the value of inventory as on the close of immediately preceding previous in any other cases. So if it has been commenced during the period that date on which it has been commenced or in any other cases it is a going concern in the previous year also it was there. So the value which was there in the closing wall value would become the opening inventory here in this case too. Then after discussing the opening inventory now on to the next point. The point being change in method of valuation of inventory. So what is this change in valuation of inventory? We know there are various methods that we were mentioning earlier in order to value inventory. Specific identification was there. FIFO was there. Weighted average was there. Standard cost was there. Retail method was there. Now one company was being supposed using FIFO method for computing their cost of inventory. Now they have decided to go for specific identification or they have decided to go for retail method of valuation. So in such cases whether it is possible is the first question. So the first most only there are reasonable costs. If there are only a reasonable cost to change the standards prescribes that the method of valuation of inventory once adopted by a person in any previous year shall not be changed without a reasonable cost. So without that a reasonable cost that uh, valuation method should not be changed. So what is the reasonable cost is not being defined. Anyhow, the guidance for the same will be taken from judicial precedents. So there are various case laws. Some among those I have uh, plotted here. In case of uh, Snow White Food Producers Company versus CIT, it, um, the facts of the case was SC has been following the mercantile system of accounting and now they had a, a board of directors and shareholders of SSC supporting the change except for the Statement in annual report to the effect that management has decided to account interest on cash basis for which it has not been estimated that SSE has decided to change its into regular method. It was held that the tribunal had held specifically that on evidence on record. It cannot be said that SSE has decided to change its existing regular method of accounting by any other regulated method. Hence the tribunal was right in holding that the SSE company was not entitled to change its method of accounting from mercantile to cash system insofar as credits in interest account were concerned and thus the interest accrued after 
accrued during the relevant year but not received was been liable to included in that assessment year so in conclusion the method of valuation of inventory shall not be changed without a reasonable cost and shall be followed consistently in the subsequent year we know if we keep on changing the valuation methods one by one then there would be subtle variations in the profit the consistency would not be there so all the fundamental principles would got break in so definitely yes in order to change the valuation of inventory there should be some reasonable cost it should be in a reason that wrong method was been adopted in order to get uh, uh, prop uh, regularized with uh, the normal situation legally backed situations then you can change the valuation or if there are some judicial pronouncements or change in law in such a way that the valuation of inventory has to be changed on those situations only the reasonable cost should be there so in case wherein we are having that stock valuation then in situations in those periods why right? because in form 6c if you see apart from the current period for the last two years whether there were any change in the valuation of inventory there is a point in that form 6c that we have to fill online to the officer at the time of stock valuation so in that form there are column in order to quantify how much the, whether there were any change in the valuation of inventory in case wherein there are some change in valuation of uh, inventory how much was the profit impact this year plus last two years so three years value would be required to do as per that uh, draft 6c so that is quite an important uh, quite an important important point to take care by whether there are any changes in valuation methods are being changed for the last 3 years including this year then that has to be quantified and that has to be reported in our form 6c then as2 and in as2 there are some changes change from one cost formula to another consists of change in accounting policy as such pursuant to as5 a change in method of valuation of inventory should be made only if it is requested by statute i was mentioning or for compliance with as or if it is considered that the change would result in more appropriate presentation so only in these situations it is allowed under as2 only as2 also so same same sort of a stand in india as2 change from one cost formula to another constitutes a change in accounting policy a change in accounting policy can only be made change in uh, an india as or uh, results in financial statements providing reliable and more information so almost same views in icds as2 as well as in uh, india as2 also so almost same so only if it there are some reasonable costs then only we would be required to change such valuation then valuation in inventory in case of certain dissolutions dissolutions meaning at the time of death or at the time of dissolution of partnerships if the inventory has to be valued how it has to be valued if you go by in that cases it should not be cost or net realizable value whichever is lower it's an exception exception where in case of certain dissolution the partnership or association of person or body of individual notwithstanding whether a business is discontinued or not the value of inventory or the date of dissolution shall be net realizable value nrv icds2 now prescribes the valuation of inventory nrv is all cases wherein there is dissolution of firm aop or boi irrespective of the fact whether on the dissolution the business has discontinued or not because of going concern assumption in as2 or in as2 there cannot there is no such a clause so how to value the inventory how to value the inventory in case of certain dissolutions are not at all dealt with uh, this uh, as2 nor with uh, in as2 all these things would be uh all these points are not been covered under as2 or in as2 for the reason that it follows going concern basis so this point is silent in as2 as well as in in as2 but there is a specific mention in case of dissolutions dissolution meaning at the time of dissolution of firm and dissolution of partnership both are two context one partner admits it's actually a dissolution of a partnership and a new partner comes in so in such cases that uh, value has to be made on net realizable value there the fundamental principle nrv or cost whichever is lower would not give into account so this is how that uh, valuation should be in case of dissolutions i do think today by this we would be finishing tomorrow we would be coming up to compare this uh, icds 2 with that of accounting standards and uh, in days plus certain inventory valuation we were not indulging today that is how to value 
those inventories out of scope of this uh, ICDS2 we were mentioning in the scope paragraph itself for construction contracts how to value we didn't mention then in case we are in work in progress for uh, tangible fixed assets how to value then how to value the shares dependencies any other financial instruments how to value livestock agriculture forest produce mineral oil oil and natural gas how to value the machinery spares used in connection with the tangible fixed assets all those things we would be discussing part of tomorrow's discussion apart from this uh, so many other complex situations so many other practical intricacies would be also mentioned tomorrow so that uh, icds standards along with how to correlate how to connect this icds valuation with that of form 6c so there 6c also we would be discussing tomorrow so with this uh, some questions are there in the inbox so as now it is uh, almost 5:30 i do hope we can uh, discuss all those questions tomorrow so my general request to the pradada sir to copy those queries and uh, kindly do mail me that uh, we would be discussing the same tomorrow so thank you all the august audience yes thank you all the august audience for your patient listening hoping to see all these faces or all these attendees tomorrow too thank you thank you trd for giving me the opportunity shall see you tomorrow thank you one and all yes sir we will be joining at the same time tomorrow Yes, yes, please. So, thank you all for your patient hearing.